I got to know, uh, did did you guys name the band Gang of Youth so that you would be next to Gang of Four in the record store? Gang of Four, Sonic Youth, put them together, Gang of Youth. It was meant to be one record. Uh, and then I'd go and get a job doing something normal. And then it sort of <laughs> spiraled out of control, snowballed into the awful thing that it is now. So it, it was it was an uneventful, like, first year. Uh, and I thought I could get away with a, such a stupid name. Um, yeah. But unfortunately, it sort of followed us around. I think a lot of people, <laughs> well, there's so much regret I think people have if they throw something into the title with youth, with kids. With yeah. you know, at some point, I mean, like, one you know, day, I mean, one day, God forbid, I'm in a band when I'm 60, but one day I'll be, you know, it'll be gang of boomers or something. Um, <laughs> I just, I've always, I've always had like an enormous regret about it, but there's not much I can do to change it. Um, and also, people, people, you know, googling gang of users is a mixed bag because you often get horrible stories from all manner of different developing nations where a gang of views robs liquor store and murders somebody. It's sort of right. got that. Balance. And that used to be a novelty until we were constantly tagged and things online about horrific crimes being committed elsewhere. So, <laughs> Oh, dear God. I want to know, <laughs> you know, when you were making this record, um, you recorded it in London, yes? Yeah, we recorded in about seven countries, actually, but London predominantly. Yeah, we, okay. did, we did a lot of recording everywhere. But uh, London, London, we set up our own little studio space and did the bulk of it there. And are you the kind of band that has songs almost completed before you hit the studio or are you someone who can actually work in the studio absolutely not not only do i not have songs completed in the studio i didn't have songs completed basically two weeks before the record was supposed to be delivered so i i think prior to all this um all this stuff with angel in real time I, there was a there was i suppose i had stuff for the last two albums sort of prepared but this one i kind of went in with maybe three that were already written and the rest were just right on the fly and i think i kind of had to follow the muse i suppose and things kept revealing themselves to me about my dad's life and about you know the actual subject matter and the source material and um it just felt it, it felt like it would have been a bit unfair to have already determined what the songs would be before they were able to come to life and also i just I'm just not that good at doing that <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I have to I have to improvise, otherwise I otherwise I, I sink. Well, I think that writing ab about something as personal as the loss of, of of your father, that you would have to have a certain amount of trust within your bandmates to go. Well, this is you know this is where I'm at. This is what I'm feeling, and are, are we all cool with this? Because this is this is it. One hundred percent trust. Always 100% trust. I think the, the four of them understand what was going on in my head and they 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 got the vision of what I think I, I needed to do. And it needed to be maximalist. It needed to be offensive to taste-making um, sensibilities. It needed to be a complete violation of all those things. That it needed to not be a down-tempo, miserable, sad, sodden record that everyone expects. You know, there's this weird idea that somehow you can only convey deep, true emotion with the sad, quiet intimacies. And I, I resent right. that. I think it's a right. very, um, you know, I think it's a very old fashioned way to look at, you know, look at music. I think to convey things with huge, enormous, sweeping, um, panoramic, you know, style songs, I think is just as effective. And we wanted to combine the two sensibilities there. Um, there was a lot of, I think there's a lot of groundswell around what we do and it being too big or too ambitious or too much stuff or too overcrowded. And I just shrugged my shoulders and laughed at it, I guess. What, <laughs> studio, too, just, what really does too ambitious mean? Exactly. I, know. I think not. I think maybe not curtailing oneself to the expectations of what a quote unquote indie rock band is supposed to look like or feel like in 2022. Small. Right. Um, I think that's probably what it looks like. I mean, I'm just talking from critical from a critical eye, um, basically. You know, really looking at what what people are into, listening to, and I, I think we, the five of us, have never been great at um, listening to advice and telling us how we should go about our business. So I think I think we wanted to do something that was not what was around one yeah i think i think we might have managed that whether or not it's good is a completely different matter i think but it's ours so <laughs> yeah and it's out of your hands kind of in a way too you yeah. know? i always think once yeah. you put out the record it's like wow well, I, I don't need to lose sleep over this anymore it's like it's out it's somebody else I, I will lose sleep over it irrespective i think regardless that there's no sleep going to be had i think it's it's not necessarily the reaction i'm worried about it's 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 more about the the idea that so much of myself and my dad I've allowed and I've propelled out into the world. And that's a terrifying thing. You know, how much of me is too much. Can I ask this? Um, my father passed away as well. And I, um, I'm sorry to hear that. 
Well, and I'm sorry for your loss as well, but I, I did have, there's, uh, my whole family has quite a dark sense of humor, pretty gallows, but uh, <laughs> people, people would say to me, and I know it's just the thing people say, because what the hell do you say? But they would always say, oh, I'm sure he's, he's watching over you. And I would just have to stifle a laugh because it's like, um, I doubt it because that's not what he did in life, you know, because he also <laughs> had change now that he's crossed over and now he's this protective. It's like, nah, my thought is that that's not so much the case. But I know, again, people don't know what to say, but when you put it down, um, you know, as a song that's going to be pretty much infinite, it's going to live forever. It's, I think it's pretty vulnerable and cool to like be able to explore that kind of pain. And like you said, it doesn't have to be like a, you know, a 1980 Cure record. It's like, it can be <laughs> big and bright and, and even pop, you know? Yeah. I think, I think the sensibilities that we were trying to attach ourselves to were very much about this idea of maximal expression. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, multi-layering 60, 70, 80 to 300 tracks per, per, per song. Um, when you look at our logic sessions, they're just a complete mess. Um, the, the idea of my dad looking down, I think on a, on some spiritual level, I, I get the sense that he surrounds me or he, 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 he shrouds my conscious mind kind of wherever I go. In that sense, I feel that way. I feel like he lives sort of in this weird part of me. Um, mm-hmm. But he was the kind of man to do that in life. He cared about what I did. He cared. That's nice. About, yeah. And that was, and that was a thing, but it's interesting. Like it's, it's, it's about the, for me, it's about the, the metaphor of his spirit being around, you know, maybe if it's, even if it's not a literal thing that I can follow. And I think in the music, I wanted to ex- expound upon things that would have given him great joy. You know, like there's a lot of references to great American modern masters, minimalists, Terry Riley, mm-hmm. Rush, Glass, Lamont Young, the, the, you know, the, the people who, um, who I think made great substantial pieces of work that were jam packed full of stuff. Oh, and yeah. there's a lot of, you know, I was listening to counterpoints, um, uh, stuff that Steve Rice did about Holocaust survivors um, fleeing to, to America, and um, there's still a lot of joy in that, and there's still a lot of there's a lot of pathos as well. And I think I, I love I love those kind of contrasting um, contrasting emotions in music. I think a lot of what Gang of Youth does is about contrast. You know, you have mm-hmm. these big bright melodies and huge sweeping grand grandiose statements with kind of depressing angst ridden sour conversational lyrics sometimes and i like that i enjoy that it gives me gives me a will to keep going do you know do you ever, did you ever get the feeling um that being around somebody who whose death is imminent that you almost selfishly are looking to that person to make you feel better about it yeah totally like, for my dad for absolutely like it's just i mean i've done it i've done it throughout my life you know mm-hmm. i've been around people who weren't well and i think um i think for this period though i had to just strap on my big boy pants and and sort of look at my dad and, and not look to him to try and comfort me in this mm-hmm. um because he'd done that he'd done that 26 years and i think i owed it to my father to be without without going foraying too far into like a cliched kind of masculine trope or whatever to be to step into the the yes. shoes of my father to be that kind of the, the stability that he was for me without gendering it do you know what i mean because, right. you know well i think that's because my, my sister had to do the same thing too and we didn't sure. want to buy too much of them yeah i think that that also brings out those uh really carved out roles in a family during a time of of real distress and trauma it's like if you were the fu- oh, the screw up in the house then you <laughs> You became the huge screw up during this time, or if you were the, you know, empathetic giver, then you you were heightened. I mean, I think I'm only speaking from my own experience. No, but. of course, of course. I mean, I I've I've always been the family screw up. I was the one voted most likely in my household to screw everything up. <laughs> so I think for me, <laughs> taking on this taking on this kind of weird, you know, pyrrhic responsibility was. I don't know. It, it, it liberated me from that reputation. I think it gave me something, mm-hmm. you know, worth fighting for in that. And that was to make my dad's life, end of life, more comfortable and to give comfort to my mum, my sister, and my wife. And, you know, my, my sister's husband was extraordinary as well. He stepped up, you know, and it was, yeah. it was, it was that, that kind of solidified, I think, 
you know, probably the next 10 years of my life and relating to my family. Um, yeah. So I, I, I'm just glad that my dad wanted me around. You know what I mean? Right. I'm glad that I never alienated him. You know, he wanted yeah. me there and that's, that's a good thing. I think. You can find humor in, um, or I can find humor or just the ridiculousness of, uh, of life and death. Yeah. And, yeah. um, yeah. the, the night that my father passed away, he passed away at home and, um, we called you know, whoever the hell you call to like yeah. you know, the, the, the and they body went bag the wrong, club. and they yeah. went to the wrong house. Okay, <laughs> so it was three in the morning, and we're standing out in the front yard. My brother's doing the the whistle at these yeah. two like absolute goons in black coats walking up to a dark house while we're like down the street <laughs> no. going here. So you know, again, but I I do want to <laughs> ask you. It was crazy. I want to ask you about specifically about that song, Brothers. Um, what what specifically do you think? It's oh, very multifaceted, know. that one. Yes. And I mean, if I were <laughs> to make my own educated or non-educated guess, um, just the this with secrets being held in the family, family and seeking out uh, the truth and then literally seeking out the siblings that you did. Um, I just knew when I was a kid that my dad was hiding stuff. Um, mm. He was a, a tremendously sweet, gentle, charismatic, intelligent, bright, sincere man, you know, unemployed. So he was home basically most of my childhood. Um, mm. But I always knew that there was like something he was hiding and I wanted to know what that was. And so when I went looking for it, um, my wife and I went to Samoa, found all this family that thought my dad died in the 70s. Um, and then we were told that I have these brothers um, uh, in New Zealand. When I, when I found them, that reconnection was, for me, um, radical and life-changing and transformative, but also it felt like no big deal because it was something that deep down in my soul, maybe, in my gut, I already kind of knew. Like, yeah. it just felt like a part of me was being returned. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think totally. that's, what, that's, that, that's what I think the crux of the song is about. It's about restoration, restoration of truth and family. And like, everyone's got family secrets. And my father, mm -hmm. you know, he's an indigenous man, black and indigenous men from born in the thirties and forties are often mm -hmm. filled with stories like these. And I, I think it was sort of returning something, rest a restoration, you know, I make something like sense. that. Yeah. yeah. That makes perfect sense to me. Now, how, uh, when you did meet your extended family, then, um, were they aware that that they had been a secret to you? Yeah, they, they thought so. They thought that um, they thought, like I said, they thought my dad died in the seventies. So me oh, turning okay, up sure. was like was like seeing a ghost. It was yes. it was like I'd I'd been just grown grown in the ground in a greenhouse somewhere and delivered to them fully formed. It was it was right. sort of that that astonishing. My auntie, my dad's youngest sister, was living in Sydney at the time. And I turned up and she said, one, uh, we won some some award in Australia and I was on TV doing my doing mm -hmm. the bows. And um she said, I thought I thought I recognized you. It was really oh. strange. Um and it was it was that surreal that I could be living 20 minutes away from her, but she had no idea I existed or that her her brother was still alive all that time. You know? Right. And I think I think for me, like a lot of what this album's about is about giving the people in my family peace of mind that they're important now and that yeah. despite my father's decisions like i i, I want to be included in my bam you know my my family ties to them a set in stone yeah. does that make sense and set in record you know i oh, can't yeah. really run away from it now absolutely and i yeah. think that you know again when you write a, a record like this um you're going to perform these songs live and um you know and then it's like i said again it's it's up to the receiver the the ears the people to either make what they will of it or take it very literally. And I guess that's the joy of songwriting is that, you know, take it for what you want it to be. I don't necessarily have to like stand up here and correct every, you know, no, that's about this. It's kind of nice, isn't it? To just be able to go, what does it mean to you? I want to universalize all these songs because I think the story, yeah, it's, an, it's a story about a man from a Pacific Island who went and when you had kids and had more kids and it's about that, but you know, I think universalizing all these things are really important because there's broader senses of grief and loss and faith and, you know, identity and stuff like that. And I think yeah. the, these, song, I, these songs are, they're, they're built with intention, you know, they're constructed with intention from us to you, mm -hmm. the listener or to whoever, but, you know, part of the, the whole point of why we do it is so people can make their own decisions, come to their own conclusions. And I think that's why I'm, 
you know, you, like you said, you know, I don't, I don't have any control over how people receive the songs or interpret them. You can't, you can't try and force that. I think yeah. the best thing to do is to get ahead of it, get ahead of it in time, state your piece about what the track's about or what the album is, and then allow people to take their own journey with that information in mind. I think a lot of art that I like and I respect has context like that. I don't, right. I don't, I don't really care much for overt kind of mystery that's there purely to create myth around a record. I find that really boring. Right. Right. Yeah. I know. And it is, it's just, I mean, it's each individual songwriter's wheelhouse, Pro- whether they're comfortable. It's the prerogative, yeah. It's the prerogative yeah. to do so, yeah. I, my, I'm, I, like, I always say this, I can't be like a big shot great like Trent Reznor or like Taylor Swift. They hide the meaning. I'm not that. I'm not that good. No. I, do, I, have to, I have to give the context out. And it's important. It's like, I, I believe that most, most albums owe a great debt of great, a great debt to intertextuality and to like to context and to thought and there's so many references and just like insanities in this album that would be stupid not to at least try and explain myself trying to take ownership for the garbage right you know so, right i do yeah. so what so what does the next couple of months look like for you guys i mean do you have things on the books or is everything feel tentative still um i actually <laughs> just don't know i'm the wrong person to ask anytime my mum asks me what i'm doing i don't know um yeah. i think yeah touring looks fine in the states we had to can a bunch of europe stuff uh, we're going to do that later in the year mm-hmm. uh, we're going to australia um which i'm excited about because i've been home in th- oh, three and a half years when that, oh, yeah. that rolls around uh, and then we'll do the states we're going to um i'm actually really excited about playing north carolina we're doing two shows in north carolina um uh, because my wife's my wife grew up there, um, but also the last time we were in Minneapolis, um, we played, I think, 7th Street Entry. I, I think mm. we played, I can't, don't know where we're playing, maybe first step, but um, I, like, Minneapolis is probably, like, Twins is probably, like, the best shows that we've done in the States always tend to be there, and I've got a friend there, and it's just a nice, it's a nice trip for me to make, you know. I mean, unless it's absolutely freezing, which is not not ideal, but... Yeah. Well, you, you, but you've just said something that I think very rarely does anybody ever say is, wow, we've well, played to some of the best crowds we've had. We're in the Twin Cities because people cannot separate it from the weather. But the problem here's the thing let me just clarify living in, yeah. um, yeah, living in Minneapolis as a choice. Um, you appreciate change because yeah. we have four distinct seasons, and That's it's it. like That's it. one is brutal. I'm not going to deny it, yeah. and, but it weeds out all the weak, you know, and then. We, I think we just relish change more. And because we're in that sort of what's known as flyover country for a lot of bands, yeah. it's like everybody that started a band in the Midwest worked a little harder because it's like you didn't have a coast. You didn't have these big things. You were a yeah. little more underground, probably a little more drunk. You were like <laughs> <laughs> in a basement, a garage. And it really, I honestly think it kind of uh, propelled people to, to be more creative. I think so much about Minneapolis has informed like my my own musical identity, who's could do um, mm-hmm. the replacements, obviously. And there's a great that great poem on the Tom Waits album. Um, I think it's Rain Dogs, Ninth and Hennepin. Yeah. I stood on the corner of Ninth and Hennepin last time we played there, and it was freezing cold. I just wanted to understand what he was talking about. Um, Christmas card. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. All that. I think, and um, you know, our, our guitar tech Stewie, he, he he's lives there. You know, so mm-hmm. Minneapolis has this weird this weird pull on me just because of its history and its heritage and uh, all so much great American rock music and any American music has started there. And I, I, I think Dante Culpepper played there, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> played for the Vikings, right, right. So, you know, so I think, I think, I think it's artistic and sporting heritage for me is pretty exciting. And I love playing there. Uh, I just, and I love the people, the hard times cafe. It's all, it's all great. It's all great stuff. <laughs> your, your wife's family in North Carolina, in North Carolina, they've never, they've never seen you perform. Uh, my father-in-law who lives in Michigan has, um, okay. my, my, my mother-in-law who I love very much hasn't, so she'll be there. Um, she, she, I'm going to, I'm going to try and find some kind of ostentatious throne to perch her on near the, uh, yes. near the sound desk and get people to give her <laughs> gifts, lay them before her feet. Um, <laughs> so, uh, I, it's really weird. Like I, my wife had no real understanding as to kind of what we were back in Australia and mm-hmm. I kind of liked that. Um, yeah. I think I think touring the US now might might give her family a bit more context as to what I do for a living. But I've never yeah. tried to never tried to actively encourage that. Do you know what I mean? That's that. The point well, in who knows? You know, maybe yeah. in their mind's eye, you were hugely famous, or they might have thought you were just like a, a mop squeezer working somewhere. You know, 
I prefer I prefer the reputation and work of a mop squeezer, if I'm honest. But, As do I. Yeah, yeah, I pretty proper much work class. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, I don't want to keep you too long. And again, I, I, I really think that it's uh, it's amazing. I just think when when you have a story to tell and it's it's you know one that's truly on the emotional side, then like you said, again, contextualize, put it out in the way that you guys know how to make music without having to cater to the sadness and the the sort of on the surface stuff when you say, Well, my father died, and then it's like everybody's like Oh, it, you just kind of have to battle through it and just yeah, go. Oh, it's just, it's, a- it's, just, it's this weird critical demand to be intimate constantly or to leave mm-hmm. space and that you can't have, you can't have six, seven, eight different layers of things, you know, that, that somehow you need space. I feel like it's a really like archaic way to view a record or an album. Like everything has to sound like Jackson Brown, which is right. great, but I can't do that. He's, he's right. amazing. I ain't. So I think this is the, like, yeah, trying to, trying to avoid, um, <laughs> like the masturbatory cliche though yeah. trying to avoid trying to avoid um doing what they want yeah doing what they want you to do i think that was kind of the motivation and you know like it was it was a collective ideology that we had in the band a very we don't really hold on to many ideologies but that was the one that we did creatively we wanted to we want to do our own thing and carve our own course and you know this is um this isn't this isn't maybe accessible to smart to smart people but yeah who knows maybe it is i don't know you can't, you can't overrate dumb sometimes dumb is just what you need <laughs> yeah sometimes sometimes it's, i think that's I, look i'm not even going to say say dumb i just think like there's i i the, the lyrics are already kind of overly literary as it is like i don't want to patronize people by making them wait through six minutes of slowness instead of six minutes of Enormity, right. do you know what I mean? I think I think that was kind of part of my mentality with it. Do you know what I mean? And I think music for the people is important. Yeah, uh, I do. I do. I, I think. I think uh, we didn't want to really necessarily care about casting a wide net, but we cared about casting. Uh, we cared about a vision that people could grapple with wherever they sat. You know, whatever class, yeah. race, gender, you know, all that. So we wanted that. We wanted to have this this sense of like, oh, that's a melody that I can remember. Right. Those are those are a set of lyrics that have deep deep meaning and application. To me. I wonder yeah. if you. I wonder if we were to talk in like ten years or fifteen years, if you would have such a different ideology about that. Because I just this brings up a story that uh, Iggy Pop was on tour and um, somebody was like at his bus and handed him a disc and said, "Can you sign this?" And uh, my friend who witnessed this, uh, he just wrote, "I owe you nothing," and handed it back to them. <laughs> Which is kind of terrible and kind of great at the same time. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't have the, I don't have the courage or the, I can't be bothered. <laughs> I don't, well, I just can't be bothered being like that to people. It's just not really my, not really my thing. If, if, if my dad wouldn't do it, then I certainly would have. So Iggy can do what he wants. He, he's Iggy Pop, and I'm just Dave. <laughs> I'm a nobody. I came in this world screaming, crying, covered in blood, a nobody, and I'd like to go out a nobody. So. That's a perfect way to end this. Thank you so much, Dave, for taking the time to chat. And uh, Legend, the record so Angel, Angel in Real Time will be out, and it is listed in your record store next to Gang of Four and Sonic Youth. And uh, <laughs> thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day. You're a legend. Thanks so much for having me. Bye bye.